Well, good morning. Wow, what a crowd today. This is wonderful. Amen. I just know, I normally don't see Joanna sitting up here at the front, and I just shocked me for a sec. <laughs> All right. What, what pardon? 20, is, is, is it 29 again? I hung on to that for several years, and I finally had to ship to 39 and then 59, and I don't keep track anymore. Well, it's great to see you. Hey, I want you to turn to the person next to you and very loudly say, I'm awake! All right. You say, you say why in the world would we be saying that today? Well, uh, you lost an hour of sleep last night, didn't you? Yes, you did. And I already somebody confessed to me this morning, well, I'm, I'm sleepy. I said, yes. And they finished the sentence. I lost an hour of sleep last night. Well, it's so great to see you today. A uh, couple of things. Now, starting next week, uh, we have spring break. And uh, so I understand what all that means. I've, I've been through many, many spring breaks. <laughs> When you're in Virginia, in a metropolitan area, not all schools take spring break at the same time. So you go through that, through the month of uh, March, uh, with people coming and going because of spring break. So if you, it's spring break, if you're going somewhere, go, okay? Uh, I'm going to pray for you while you're gone. Be careful when you go. And hurry home, okay? That's all we ask, all right? And we will pray for you. Okay, great. Well, uh, I think all of the transition team leaders are here today, okay? So if you guys would just come up here and join me. And here's what we're going to do this morning. These, these folks, I'm, I'm proud of these folks. You should be proud of them. Yes, give them a hand. We, uh, be, because of, of David having to leave early and me coming late, I'm kind of a Johnny come lately, so it took us a while to get the team together because I didn't know anybody when I got here, and uh, I had to ask God to help me, and he did, and uh, we, have, we, have, we have seven wonderful team leaders. Now, um, you say, well, where's there, where is everybody? <laughs> well, uh, Nancy was here, but Nancy's getting over COVID, and so she had to go home. She had to cough. And Nancy's our prayer coordinator. Uh, if, if you're on the prayer team, there's a dozen people on the prayer team. I don't even know who they all are. All I know is if you call Nancy or somebody on that team and say, I need to be prayed for, my phone lights up, okay? And uh, so we appreciate what Nancy does, okay? Uh, these folks have different responsibilities, and, and what I wanted to do, uh, or what I was going to tell you is, we really didn't get to start working on this in earnest until January, okay? And these folks just jumped right in with their team, and, uh, and so what I thought I'd do, uh, I, what I'd like to do is to ask them to share with you just a very brief report, okay? If, if their reports go too long, I'll have to cut the message down. Okay, I probably shouldn't have said that up front. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. Well, he said he didn't want us to go first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my team has been up to so much. Um, so I am. My team is the empowering leadership and gift-based ministry. Um, and just something that you guys can be looking forward to that you'll see here shortly is we're going to have everybody in the church um, take a spiritual gifts assessment. Um, and then what we're going to do is kind of form a spiritual gifts database um, where we can see, uh, we can put everybody in our congregation in there, their gifts. Um, and then what we're going to try to do is empower those people then to go out and serve in the church um, and Great. make sure that we're having people serving in their gifts 
um, and not just serving to be somewhere um, to fill a spot, but actually serving um, in their giftings. So we'll be doing that. Um, and then one other thing that we've talked about is um, we'll be doing eventually uh, some sort of leadership workshop um, for all of our leaders in the church, um, as well as all of our youth. Um, our team has a few different teenagers on it. Um, and uh, if you know me, you know I'm passionate about the next generation. So we're going to work with Wildfire Youth Ministry and kind of do a uh, training to help the teens um, kind of grow in their giftings as well. I am. Uh, help me, Jim. I can't remember. It's a weird name. Effective structures. If you can remember that, then you're better than me. Um, but we were dealing with. First, we went through and evaluated all the ministries within the church, and evaluated whether they were effective. Um, from here, I want to say my team. I, ha I thought I had an amazing team. Marana Oakley. Scott Dow and Aaron Oliver um, tried to get a diverse age group in there, um, and I wanted to get people that would not be wishy-washy. They would tell me what they thought. Um, Marana being the youngest, she did a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you to them for their time and their input. Um, but we went through and evaluated whether we thought ministries were effective. And at one point, we decided that's not good enough. We don't know. We're not a part of a lot of these ministries. We need to ask them individually if they think they're effective. So we made up a, a list of questions. We went to the groups. And a lot of the answers, some of them we expected. Some of them were like, okay, that's pretty eye-opening. Um, but from all of that, we created a list of questions that on the actually requested by the TIPS ministry to present questions that could be presented to each group on a six month or annual basis so they can self evaluate, see where they're at, see what changes they need to make. So we've created a list of questions for that. We've also made some changes, some suggested changes in the way we approach ministry. We want to make this church where you come and you're enthusiastic about the church that you serve. That's right. Amen. You're enthusiastic Great. about the God Great. that you serve. And another thing that we thought really needs to be implemented, and this stemmed from some of the answers that we got, that men don't usually know what the women's group's doing. Women don't usually know what the men's group's doing. Nobody knows what the youth are doing. I'm not, I'm not trying to be negative, but we don't talk among the groups. If you come to this church and you see someone out there and they've got a family that's searching, can you say our youth group is doing this this month, next month, and the next month after that? I know I can't. So we need to figure out a way to make our church effective as a whole. Right. Great. So Great. that's where we're at. Hopefully you made sense. Um, I'll let Courtney talk. Great. <laughs> um, my group is holistic small group. So several years, not several, a couple years back, we had life groups and they were developed. And so we, myself, Joanna, Bailey, and Matt Brady, um, we are the holistic small group team. We've kind of analyzed what has worked in our church before, what hasn't, while also pulling in experiences from other churches that we have all attended. Um, to try and form what's going to be best for our church at the present day, not where we were five years ago. Um, so trying to make a combination. We're a smaller church right now, and we have those groups formed. So we're trying to pinpoint how to develop small groups within those groups and then branch out eventually. So in the next probably several weeks to over a month, you will probably get a lot of information about small groups. Um, we are also hosting a leadership training on leaders who want to lead a small group. So if you are interested and are like, hey, I love small group settings, please come talk to one of us because we would love to um, hear from 
all voices of what they would like to lead and what they would like to get involved with. Um, so that's going to come up in the ho next month probably. And then from then we will implement um, one of the suggestions from TIPS was to first start with a book that Pastor David started teaching on on Sunday school, which was Loving the Church. Um, and then there's like a colon and some more stuff, but it's in my back. Um, so we're going to start with that, but then it'll branch out um, into more specifics for those small groups. Um, those small groups can then take off and do their own, but that's long-term plan. We're looking at short-term right now. So if you're interested, come talk to one of us. So most of y'all heard from me last week. You get a repeat, sort of. Um, I am in charge of need-oriented evangelism, also known as outreach, in our community. Um, my team and I first got together, and we kind of evaluated over a time period what we thought the needs in our community were. And our first project we chose was to do the Food for Kids, the backpack program. Um, last Wednesday, a couple of us were able to go and help pack the bags and get some further information. We also were able to take approximately 180 oatmeal packets, 150 ramen noodle packets, and we're about 60 for the pasta and rice sides, which we were assigned to gather for what she needed for the program. They are still currently packing 300 bags every week, so we haven't even met enough for one weekend yet. Um, this week we will be going again Wednesday at 1, if anybody wants to join us to pack these bags at the Bible Church here in Charleston. Um, we are packing for spring break, and they are able to send more food home with the kids that need it right. over spring break. Um, also the blood drive. We have another blood drive in April scheduled, one in June, so be on the lookout for that. Um, my team's amazing, and I appreciate what they're doing, and thank you guys for helping with bringing food in so far. Okay, this is, if you know me, this is not my gift to speak in front of people, so I'm about to pass out. Um, but we'll, we'll, like, we'll catch you if you go. Thank you. Um, my group is Loving Relationships, so more behind the scenes where I like to be. Um, uh, our goal is to provide opportunities to build relationships each, with each other within the church. So it's our job to provide events, um, opportunities for you guys to mingle together, um, get to know people that you don't know yet in the church, and um, build those relationships deeper and deeper. Um, what we're working on right now is um, Easter. Um, we are planning that for March 31st, at, and there's an egg there's a breakfast at 9 a.m., an egg hunt at 9.30, and then church at 10.30. Um, and we are still looking for a few people to make a breakfast casserole. If you're interested in doing that, um, come find me, and I'll get you up to set that up, please. Um, we have talked about a lot of different ideas, so I'll just kind of go through some of the ideas that we are planning to implement soon. Um, the meal train, um, we don't currently have like a meal train for our church, so um, we plan on starting that immediately. Um, if there's a death, if there's a birth of a baby, um, if there's a sickness, illness, injury um, in someone's family, please let us know. Um, my team cons consists of me, um, Angela, Stacy Bieber, and Nancy. Um, and so if you know of a need in our church, we can set that up online and then everyone can sign up um, for what they want to bring that family. Um, so that's a way that we can um, really show the love of Jesus to that's each other um, just in daily life. Um, Angela is working on a monthly newsletter. Um, I know a lot of people and we have felt, our family has felt like this at times um, in the church that we don't really know what's going on. And this kind of ties with Mike's, what Mike was talking about. Um, like just somewhere that we can look to know this is what's going on, this is what's coming up, um, and this is what we can share with um, people that don't go here that we can invite them to. Um, things that might be in the newsletter are impor important dates, announcements, financial updates, or needs, things that we um, need donations for or need um, like physical items. Um, ministry spotlights, um, so 
that we can learn more about all the, the different ministries that are being created, um, family spotlights, and possibly a word from our pastor. Um, other things include um, encouragement. We hope to start sending out on more of a regular basis cards for birthdays, anniversaries, you know, the things that really are important to a lot of us. Um, we are hoping to plan a work day in late uh, spring, early summer, um, and we'd love all of your participation um, in just sprucing up the church, you know, fixing some stuff that needs fixed, and um, yeah, just making it look a, bit, a little bit better, maybe some painting, those sort of things. Um, and the last major thing is we would love to start, this, this is in the future, but we would love to start a mentorship program, um, participation where we can um, partner older age-wise or just faith journey um, older with a younger person um, in the faith or in age um, so that we can learn to mentor each other and you know if you know you, you have gone through something in your life you can connect with that per that younger person and you can kind of help them along in their faith journey. <laughs> um, other ideas just that we don't have plans for, but we'd love to, um, having hobby sharing events, um, like if you, I don't know, collect baseball cards or you knit or those type of things, we'd love to get events like that started. Um, making a church directory, um, creating a grief share, um, program. I know in other churches that we've been to, um, they've had a grief share group where you can find support there. Um, and reaching out to the homebound and movie nights or theme night dinners. So that Great. is all. Great. All right. Um, where's Seth? Come up here, Seth. Now, I want to say on Seth's behalf, he doesn't necessarily have a report, and I'll tell you why. Because Seth's responsibility, along with his team, is facilities. Maybe you do have a report. I don't want you to have thunder. Go ahead, man. <laughs> Jump in. Man. I apologize Tell for not being up here with everybody else. Sorry. Uh, my team is uh, technically first impressions team slash facilities. So if you hear that, you're probably thinking, like, why is this gentleman in charge of first impressions? <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> I kind of wonder that myself. But anyways, <laughs> uh, uh, we got a great team of people together. We're working on several different things. Um, chiefly, we're focusing on, and these three kind of uh, are very connected together, which would be our online presence, our website, stuff like that, our branding for the church, which would mean our logo, um, just getting our uh, that out in the community, and then also um, making sure our core values and mission statement is up front um, and posted in the facility so that we can see it. Um, those three are very much tied together and that's what we're really focusing on uh, right now. Like I said, we've got a great team together. We're gonna be working in the future, as Christy mentioned with her team, um, mentioned a work day. We're gonna be you know, planning with her team uh, together so that we can kind of uh, tackle some of the things that we need to accomplish with that work day. So uh, there's going to be a lot of things coming in the near future. Do you, do you see why I'm proud of these folks? God, come on, guys. <laughs> My goodness. Great day. <laughs> yeah, there you go. See it. It ought to just happen, okay? I'm extremely proud of these folks, and they have worked hard. You, you should know this, that their work will continue when your new pastor comes, okay? They don't, there's not necessarily an ending date unless he or she says, well, you've done enough. You can retire now, okay? I don't think that'll probably happen, but it, it could, all right? 
I'm so proud of what they've done. I want to get a picture of you all while, while uh, you're here. Will you let me do that? All right. Act like you like each other. I know you do. Thanks so much. Give him a hand, would you? My wife will say to me from time to time, well, uh, what's happening on the uh, transition teams? Well, I don't go to all their meetings, so I don't, don't necessarily know the answer to that. But I do know that it's important for you to know that these folks are busy at work doing the things that we need to do as a church to be what God would have us to be. That's what we want to be, is it not? Try that again. Huh? You get you get tired of me asking you three or four times. Sometime I don't know when. Probably on my last Sunday here. You, you. That's what we want to be, isn't it? The kind of church God would have us to be. Of course it is. Of course it is. Well, all right. Now, uh, let me ask you this: How many of you believe in miracles? If I ask you this morning to define the word miracle, how would you define that word? Well, I don't want to put you on the spot. Let me, let me give you a, a, a dictionary definition, okay? A miracle is a marvelous event manifesting a supernatural act of God. Let me give that to you again. Miracle is a marvelous event manifesting a supernatural act of God. And I'm not going to ask you to respond this morning, but I wonder, and pardon my voice, I have prayed over this thing, I'm telling you. Somebody said, well, by summertime, it'll be better. I hope that's not true. I'd like it to be better next week. Let me ask you, don't respond, just think about it. How many of you need a miracle in your life now for something? So I happen to know there's, I, I, I know there's a, a lady in this church that a miracle is already happening in, okay? Her name is B, okay? I have been praying and trusting God and believing God that B is going to be healed of cancer. I know, man. Did, did you stay up late last night, too? And you lost an hour of sleep on top of all that? Great day. Man. I, <laughs> actually, guys, could I tell you, I think Nazarene's a little better at responding. Okay? You, you don't want to take second place to the church of Nazarene, do you? No, you don't. You don't. You say, well, Pastor, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, my life is great right now. I don't really have a need for a miracle. Well, you may not now, but sometime in your life, you may need a miracle. You may need that marvelous event manifesting a supernatural act of God. And that's what a miracle is. I've needed miracles in my life. I've experienced miracles in my life. I don't. I didn't think about this. I could have put their picture uh, and given it to our, our, our two people and and showed you a picture of my two sons. You say, "Well, a big deal. What's so miraculous about two sons?" Well, if you knew how they came to us and you knew that story, you'd say, "Wow." It's a miracle. It's one of my colleagues at a pastors and wives meeting one time said to me, you know, 
Pastor Jim, I can't figure it out. I said, well, what can't you figure out? I can't figure out how two scrawny little people like you and your wife could have two sons that are in excess of six feet tall. I said, it's a miracle. <laughs> it's a God thing. If they were naturally born of us, they probably would be little scrawny guys. But God gave them to us. He just didn't give us two little scrawny guys. They're both six feet tall. They're military guys. I don't, one of them's retired. I don't know if he's still uh, lifting weights and running and all that stuff because he doesn't have to anymore. But the other one is still in the military. And I will tell you, I would, I would not be afraid to walk anywhere. Well, maybe Chicago would be out. New York City would be out. Some parts of Orlando, Florida would be out. In fact, some parts of Winter Haven, Florida would probably be out. But other than that, I would not be afraid to stand between those two men and walk anywhere and just dare somebody. miracle. So, if you are going to experience a miracle in your life, there are four commonalities that a miracle needs. Okay? I want to, I'll share them with you quickly, all right? And, and probably I'll move away from the outline because this is such a simple sermon. What's the first thing you need? If you're going to experience a miracle. Well, I'll tell you what it is. It is a need bigger than you are. You see, miracles don't happen if everything is okay in your life and if you have the wherewith. One of my members years ago called me up and said, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I said, okay, I always do, but what is it? Well, he said, I need a financial miracle. Oh, dear friends, let me tell you, there have been times I've needed a financial miracle. And what, is he, what was he saying to me? And, and what is it? What, what, what did I, what, 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 what was the deal in my life when I needed a financial miracle? What? It was because I had a need <laughs> that was bigger than my ability. And if you're going to experience in your life, I don't, I don't care what kind of a miracle you need, it will demand that you have a need that you can't meet. My two sons are miracles because my wife and I found out early in our married life that if we were going to have children, it wasn't going to be the way that everybody else did. You say, well, what makes you think that because you have adopted sons that that's miraculous? Well, I'll tell you that one day in, in, a, in, in a little red Volkswagen in Floyd County, Virginia, my wife is on her way to work in a little town of Stewart, which is down the mountain. And the weight of wanting to be a mom had really closed in on her. She tells she could tell the story better than I could. And that particular day, the Lord Jesus, and I don't know whether you believe in this kind of stuff or not. I hope you do because, you see, God is everywhere. <laughs> the Lord Jesus got in the passenger seat of that little red beetle. And not in an audible way, but spoke through her spirit and said, I have heard your prayer, and I will meet your need. Listen, God is interested in your life, and God is interested in my life. And when we have needs 
that are far greater than we have the ability to meet, that's when God does his best work. Could I tell you that? I, I probably already told you. Remember last week I said, if I repeat an illustration that you've already heard, you can tell me about it if you want to, but, but just say, well, poor guy. I'm surprised he knows how to get from the house over here to the church. Sometimes I'm surprised at that myself. A miracle. At times, we all need a miracle in our lives. And it will be because there's a need that is bigger than we are. We have a, a pretty, uh, well, I don't, I can't think of a good adjective, adjective to describe it. I can think of one, but I don't want to tell you. <laughs> in the Church of the Nazarene, we have what's called the budget system. And every church at the, at the beginning of what we call an assembly a year is allocated a certain amount of budgets based on the money that they spend. You'd think it would be based on the money that they raise, based on the money that they spend. One year in Chesapeake, we were having an extremely difficult year financially, and that happens in churches. I just felt the need that we should pay our fair share. And as we're approaching the end of that assembly year, I recognized that eight weeks from now will be the ending date and we needed $20,000. Here's what I knew. I knew that that was a, a need in that church that was bigger than we had. We did not have $20,000. You say, well, did, did you have a big staff? No, we had no staff at all except the secretary. Did you spend money foolishly? No, we didn't. We were, very, we were very cautious on how we spend money. It's kind of the way we are in this church, but that's the way it should be. Just because you have it doesn't mean you spend it. And I got on my face before God and said, God, you know, it's bigger than, it's bigger than me, obviously. It's bigger than this church. God spoke in my spirit and said, will you trust me for 20 grand? Listen, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But I have to confess to you that I was not sure where God would find $20,000 in that church. So God gave me a plan, and I, I just went to the church, and I said, listen, eight weeks from now <laughs> is the end of the assembly year. We are $20,000 behind on our budgets, but I believe that there's $20,000 in this church somewhere, and some of them like to fell out. And I said, I want you to trust God with me. On the last Sunday, I mean, you know, a little bit extra came in from week to week. <laughs> you know, and when you're trusting God for a miracle and you have a need, and what happens is the devil comes and says, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. You think your God is going to bail you out? You think that your God can find $20,000 in this church? Just have to listen, you just have to step up to the devil like Jesus did and look him in the eye and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. My faith is in God. And on the last day, 
when people brought their offering. <laughs> we don't do this. We don't count the money on the Sunday that we receive it. We, we have counters that come during the week and count the money and take the money to the bank. But this particular Sunday, we did. And I saw the ushers leave with the offering plates, and I saw my treasurer leave with, with some help, and they were gone, and they were gone, and they were gone. And pretty soon, I saw her walk in the back of the sanctuary. Big old smile on her face. I said, well, Ruth, what's the report? She said, well, Pastor, today we received $22,000. Yeah. You see, it was a need that we couldn't make. It was, a, it was a need that was bigger than us. And that's what God specializes in all the time. So if you're going to have a miracle, it's got to be that kind of a need. And I, I can illustrate it to you. In, in a way, out of the Word of God. In fact, the last two Sundays in the presentation of the Chosen have been on the miracles that Jesus performed, turning water into wine, healing leprosy, healing a man with crippled legs. I could walk back in the Old Testament with you this morning and talk to you about the time when Moses had a need that was bigger than him. When three Hebrew children had a need that was bigger than them. And on and on and on in the Old Testament. And then considering what Jesus was able to do when he walked the sands of the earth. It's a need. But there's a second thing. You have to pray. You have to pray. You have to get serious with God. I, I think sometimes we, we see these are things that we know. I, I'm not. I, I, I'm not preaching new stuff to you. Your former pastors have preached the same kind of thing to you. Your new pastor, when he comes or she comes will preach the same kind of message to you because we who are in the ministry all know the same thing. If you're going to have a miracle, you're going to have a need. And the second thing you've got to do is pray. Pray. Did you know that prayer is the hardest thing we do as Christians? Really, think about it. Think about it. And I'm not talking about the little prayers that we, we teach our kids, you know, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. It's wonderful to teach your kids to pray that way, but as they get older, you need to teach them to pray and believe in God. You know, we have our second adopted son because of the prayers of our first adopted son. I used to, uh, when I was home, and as I moved along in my ministry, I figured out a way. And, uh, not, it's not that I had to figure out a way. I always knew this, that my, some of my mentors were not, they, they were great guys. They just were pastors in a different generation. And one of them said to me, you know, you know Pastor Jim, if, uh, if you'll take care of the church, God will take care of your family. Boy, I, I took that to heart, man. Eight, ten, twelve hours a day, man. Leave before the kids are up, get home when they're in bed. And I want to tell you, God convicted me of that. And so I started figuring out ways to be home. I mean, you know, so nice. And so when, when I was home 
and it was bedtime for my oldest son, Eric. I would go in his room with him, and we'd get down beside his bed, and he'd, he'd already moved beyond the now I lay me down to sleep. I mean, he could pray a simple little prayer. And it always, you know, dear God, thank you for my mom and my dad. Thank you for my aunts and my uncles. I mean, you know, uh, I, 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 I thought at times he prayed for all those folks just to put off going to bed. But at the end of his prayer, before he said amen, these were his words, oh God, I want a little brother. And you know, I, I kind of smiled at that. I said, oh, isn't that sweet? Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Here, this kid, if he just understood how hard it was to get him and the prayers that Miss Barbara and I had to pray for him. But every night, oh God, I want a little brother. And one day, I will tell you, I mean, we, we didn't try to open any more doors. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, we, we said, hey, God has been so gracious to give us this child. We're going to love on him. If we don't ever have any more ch children, it'll be okay. And one day, out of the clear blue, the 1st of October, 1979, which is before some of you came into the world. The phone rings in the parsonage. It's a social worker who helped us find Eric. And she said to me, well, Jim, are you and, are you and Barbara? It's a lady that we knew. She was a member of our home church where we grew up. She said, are you and Barbara ready for another child? I said, what? Yeah. I have a situation. I have a child that's going to, going to be born. The, the mother is going to give it up for adoption because of her situation. Are you interested? I said, when is this child going to be born? She said, by the end of the month. We had, we, we had just moved to Texas. We didn't know anybody in Texas except church folks. I had to find an attorney. I mean, it was, you know, I, all that stuff's rolling through my mind. But in the back of my mind, I could hear that prayer, oh God. I want a little brother. I, I can't tell you how it all worked out, but I can tell you what a joy it was when Jonathan Mark came into our family answer to prayer, a need that was bigger than we were, but prayed for. So if you're going to have a miracle, you've got to have a need, you've got to pray. The third thing you've got to do is you've got to have faith. I like that little song. You may not, you may not know it. It's not a Nazarene song, but Church of God folks probably sang it too that says faith in God can move a mighty mountain. Faith can calm the troubled sea. Faith can make the desert like a fountain. And faith can bring the victory. I believe that. Got to have faith. Got to have faith. You see, if you don't have faith, you're not going to pray. I mean, it'd be, it'd be a tragic waste of your time to pray unless you believe in the one to whom you're praying. <laughs> I have good news for you this morning. There is a God in heaven. There is a God who in the 21st century is still interested in his people and is still able to answer prayer if we'll just believe that he is able. Illustrations have rolled by 
yeah, I'm going to let them roll on by. Because I want to move to the last thing that has to happen. And see, we understand need. We understand prayer. We understand faith. But do we understand the last thing that we need, which is expectancy? I don't know. I, I don't know about you. Here's what I do know about my oldest son, Eric, when he's praying that prayer. I mean, we, 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 would, we would do our best you know, to teach him about God and that God is able to do all things. And if, if, if you pray and you have faith, then you can expect God to answer. Dr. Tim Hill, who happens to be the general overseer of the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. Now, don't get, don't, don't get, a, don't get scared. I understand that he is a charismatic. I understand that. But I'll tell you what else I understand. That Tim Hill is a powerful, powerful preacher of the Word of God. And he doesn't let the tongues deal get in the way of his powerful preaching. And recently I heard him preaching a sermon about having faith in God. And he said, you know, what's happened in the church today is that we have lost our expector. We pray, but we don't really expect God to answer. It's kind of like the pastor of a large church in Kansas during a drought. He got up one Sunday morning and he said, you know, we need rain. and We are going to pray for rain today. And I want you, when you go home, to pray for rain. And when you come back tonight, I want you to, I want you to expect God to answer. People went home, had lunch, took their naps, came back. And one little girl came back with an umbrella. <laughs> so, why did she have an umbrella? Because the pastor said, if you pray and have faith, God is going to send rain. And she was expecting that, and she's going to be prepared for that. Expect, expect God to meet your need. Now the problem with expecting is that we want, we want God to answer our prayers, and, and, and we expect God to do that, but sometimes we expect God to do it our way. How many times have we said, oh, God, I have this need. I believe that you're able to meet this need. And, oh, by the way, God, here's how you should do it. Have you ever prayed that way? Well, I have. I've faced a couple of things. I've, I, you know, I actually tried to work out. And God spoke in my spirit and said, you know, I think sometimes God wants to say this, hey, you big dummy. But he doesn't. He loves us too much to use that kind of terminology. But, but he did speak in my spirit and say, hey, I hear you. I hear you. And I'm going to answer your prayer. But it may not be in the way that you think. It may. About Barbara and I were just talking about that this week, about praying. And expecting, but understanding that the way God answers may not be the way we expected him to answer, but he still answers. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? You know what I didn't say to you this morning at the end of the presentation of our team leaders is that you should be glad about this because, see, people have already started asking, well, Pastor Jim, when are we going to call pastor? When are we going to put those wheels in motion? Well, 
I, I believe I can say to you that on the basis of what the team has done and what they're going to continue, continue to do, and I've talked to Cody about this, that the first of next month we're going to put together a search team. How about that? <laughs> I, I feared you all would applaud. Great day. Vicki's so kind. She said, oh, Pastor Jim, why don't you just stay here and be our pastor? Well, there's a couple reasons. You guys are so young. Barb and I both have said, if we were younger, we might consider that, but we don't have the energy at our age to do that. If you'd run over us. So we're going to put together a search team. Aren't you glad about that? Yeah. Because that's the goal. The goal of me being here is to do the things that we have done in preparation for that day. Now, I, I don't know how long it's going to take, okay? But we're going to start the process. And so I'm asking you to pray about that. Will you do it? I'm asking you to believe God. Because, see, here's what I know. <laughs> Somewhere in this great land of ours. Somewhere there is a pastor <laughs> that God is already beginning to speak to about moving from where he's at and, and maybe going to a new location. I, I believe that. See, God doesn't, he normally doesn't wait till the last minute. He's way ahead of us. You may not know, and I certainly don't know, but here's what. Here's what I do know. I do know that God knows. And he's already at work. Okay? So let's pray about that, all right? Let's, let's trust God. Let's believe God. Because God <laughs> wants you to have a pastor. Somebody who's your age. Somebody who has energy. You say, well, Pastor Jim, don't you have energy? Yes, but it goes by quick. I don't mind to tell you. I used to tell my six-foot tall boys, hey, guys, I just want you to know I can do whatever you can do. I just can't do it as long. I can kick, just not nearly as high. I can run. No, I can't run anymore. But when I could run, I would say I could run, but not as fast as you guys run. Okay. You believe in God today. You believe in miracles today. A miracle is going to happen in this church. It's happening already. And I believe more than one is going to happen. Well, let's stand together. I know we're going to have a closing song. How do I know that? I see the folks coming. <laughs> I'm not telepathic. But let's pray. Dear Jesus, you, you are the God of miracles. We've experienced them in our own life. And Lord, I, I can't help believe in the history of this church that you have performed miracles. You have met needs that have been greater than this church had the ability within themselves. And the day of miracles for First Church of God in Charleston, Illinois, is not over. It will continue. It will continue. So help us put the full weight of our faith and our confidence in you. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.